Hi everyone, in this video I just wanted to talk about a couple of things relating to surface tension in liquids and potentially clear up a couple of common misconceptions along the way. So we'll start by talking about the definition of surface tension in terms of forces, talking about why it's defined in the way it is, then we'll go on to think about how surface tension relates to energy, and finally we'll talk about how exactly surface tension is responsible for liquid droplets taking on spherical shapes. So as a starting point we'll just consider the system that I've sketched out which is just a cuboid shaped um, container of liquid. The liquid is filled up to some certain height within the container and you can see there's this sort of upper surface of the liquid which I'm shading in blue. So we're going to imagine zooming into the surface and considering just one particular surface element and by surface element I basically mean an idealized two-dimensional collection of liquid molecules sitting at the interface between the liquid and uh, the air above. So that's exactly what this thing here is, that's our surface element and we're just going to draw some arrows on representing all of the forces acting on that particular element. Now if we start with the vertical forces there must of course be a weight pulling it down but in equilibrium that has to be balanced by some other vertical force. I'm going to label that as R. Now I've labeled that as R because it's kind of conceptually similar to the normal reaction force that you get when you put a solid object on a table or something like that. But you have to remember that on a microscopic scale, the origin of this upwards force is a little bit different because we don't have two solid surfaces in contact. All we have is a layer of liquid molecules sitting on the rest of the liquid molecules. So the origin of the R force in this case is ultimately due to the pressure in the bulk of the liquid that pushes in all directions, including upwards. So we've got our vertical forces and an important thing to note at this point is that I haven't said anything about surface tension as a force yet. Yet. That's just because the surface tension doesn't act in the vertical direction. It acts in the plane defined by the surface, not perpendicular to the plane defined by the surface. Now, I think that's quite a common misconception that surface tension always pulls inwards. Actually, by definition, it doesn't pull inwards. It pulls in the plane defined by the surface. Now, if your liquid has a curved surface, then the net effect of the surface tension can still make it appear as if the surface tension is pulling inwards. But I'll go into more details about how exactly that works towards the end of the video. So why is there a tension force in the plane of the surface? Well, to understand that, let's draw some molecules on one of the edges of our little surface element. So these little red dots are some liquid molecules right at the edge of the element. And I'm also going to draw some liquid molecules just next to those ones, because of course there are liquid molecules everywhere uh, in this surface. Now molecules will always, to varying extents, have attractive forces between them, intermolecular forces. And the origin of those forces um, is ultimately electrostatic. It's due to induced dipole moments in the molecules. So the molecules just outside our surface element are of course going to exert a net force uh, towards the right. I'm going to call that T1 for tension one. Now why is that tension pointing perfectly to the right, well, you can imagine extending your line of molecules um, exterior to the surface element that we're considering as far as you wanted. And you can see that there's going to be attractive forces pulling in all different directions, right, acting on the molecules in our surface element. But you can also see that the components of those attractive forces, which are not perpendicular to the edge of the surface element, are all going to cancel, leading to a net force pointing to the right. There will also be some downwards component of the force of attraction, um, because the molecules just below the surface are pulling on the molecules at the surface. But we can just sort of absorb that vertical component of the attraction into this generic reaction force, the vertical R force that we introduced earlier. By definition, the surface tension T1 is the component of the attraction that acts in the plane of the surface. Of course, by the same logic, you're going to have uh, a tension force perpendicular to each side. So I've just added those arrows T2, T3, and T4. And note also that I'm only drawing on the external forces to this particular element. There will, of course, be attractive forces between um, the molecules on the boundary and the molecules within the surface element, like these ones here. But those are um, internal forces, and so they're not going to have any sort of overall effect on what our surface element is doing. Now, because all of the liquid molecules are equivalent, it follows that the tension along side I, so Ti, is proportional to the number of molecules along side I, because the more molecules you have, the more little individual forces of attraction you're adding up to get your total tension force. And from that, we get the crucial result that the tension on side I is proportional to the length of side I, because of course, the longer the side is, the more molecules you will have um, fitting along that side. So what we can then do is just drop the subscripts, because by symmetry, we can make the same argument in any arbitrary direction we like, not just directions one, two, three, and four and we can introduce a constant of proportionality between t and l and say t the tension in any direction is gamma times the length um, of the side that we're imagining in that direction so that proportionality constant gamma um, is then of course just the tension divided by the length and gamma is in fact the surface tension It's defined to be the tension force per unit length within the surface so that's one definition of surface tension as a force per unit length so you could measure it for example in 
um, newtons per meter. The next thing I want to do is talk about how we can totally equivalently define the surface tension in terms of energy. To do that I want to think about a slightly different experimental setup. So this thing over here where we have three black lines which are bars which are fixed in position at right angles to each other and sliding on top of those we have another bar which is free to move uh, left and right. So we dip this thing into our liquid and thereby we create a film of liquid um, in that blue shaded area there. So that's like a very thin film and we can make it bigger or smaller by moving the bar backwards or forwards. So what I want to do is consider sliding the bar slightly to the right um, as I've indicated there and we're going to slide it to the right by a distance that I'm going to call delta x um, and also the sort of width of the apparatus as I've indicated there um, is L. So when we slide the bar to the right we create some new surface area which is this new bit that I'm shading blue there. Now sliding the bar to the right requires energy input because there is a surface tension as we just discussed pulling the liquid molecules on both of the surfaces the top and bottom surfaces um, towards the left. So an interesting and useful thing to consider is how much work do we have to do um, to, to slide the bar by a distance of delta x. So we can just use the fact that work done um, for a constant force is force times distance. So you can say delta e, change in energy, which is just work done, um, is the tension force that we're working against multiplied by the displacement, delta x. The tension force, of course, is just the surface tension gamma multiplied by the length L. Then we multiply that by delta x. Then L delta x has a special significance because it's just the area of the rectangle um, of sort of new surface area that we're creating. And so we could write that as gamma times delta A. That gives us a new way to interpret the meaning of this gamma quantity. You could write it as delta E by delta A. In other words, it's the energy cost of creating a unit of surface area. It is worth noting, by the way, that the actual amount of work you would have to do to slide the bar over by delta X is twice as big as what this equation gives because you're creating new surface on both the top and the bottom, or equivalently because both the top and bottom faces of the film are pulling um, with equal forces to the left. That's why I've specified that this is the work done against surface tension on the upper face, or you know, we could have equivalently said on the lower face, but just one of the faces. So let's now put both of these definitions of surface tension um, into practice and use them to understand why in the absence of external forces a liquid droplet will form a spherical shape. In other words, unless there's a significant amount of gravity or some other force acting on your liquid droplet, it's not going to form uh, like an ellipsoid shape like the one I've sketched there. So let's first explain this phenomenon using the force definition of surface tension. And to do that, we're going to consider surface elements at various different positions um, around this sort of imaginary ellipsoid shaped um, droplet. So if you consider a surface element at the top, remember that the surface tension is a force that acts in the plane of the surface. But unlike the examples we considered earlier, we now have a curved surface. And so the surface tensions in different directions will actually be pulling in different spatial directions, although they're all locally along the surface. So there's going to be one surface tension pulling sort of to the left and a little bit downwards locally along the direction of that surface. Um, similarly, there is going to be a force pulling to the right and a little bit downwards. And if you imagine that this is actually a 3D object, you're also going to have one um, sort of coming out of the screen and going a little bit downwards as well, and also one going into the screen and pulling a little bit downwards. Um, again, all in the local direction um, of the curved surface. Now, if you add all those individual surface tensions together to get an overall force, you can see that by symmetry, the sort of left and right and in and out components are going to cancel, but the downwards components will all add up. So you'll get some resultant force acting downwards um, from those individual surface tensions, and I'm going to label that as F1. Now, of course, you can repeat that exercise for a surface element anywhere on the surface, and I've done that for one um, over on the far right there. Now, the important thing to notice about these arrows is that the strength of each of those tension forces is the same as the four tension arrows that I drew for the surface element at the top, because the surface tension gamma is just a constant for a particular um, liquid in contact with a particular gas. However, there is less curvature uh, on this particular ellipsoid over on the right, and so the inwards component of those four arrows is less. So you would still have a resultant force pointing inwards, um, which means sort of to the left here, um, but it's going to be less than F1, so I could label that as F2 and just highlight the fact that it's less than the resultant force F1. So we can generalize this idea and say that um, areas of a curved surface which are more curved, or equivalently which have a smaller radius of curvature, are going to be pulled inwards more strongly. So if you start with a liquid surface of some arbitrary shape, the effect of the surface tension um, is that it's basically going to eliminate any non-uniformities in the curvature, and a shape with the same amount of curvature everywhere is 
is of course a sphere and you can see that in a nice concrete way with the ellipsoid we, we were talking about earlier you can see that the element at the top is going to be pulled down more strongly than the element at the right and so this ellipsoid is going to be flattened vertically and settle into a spherical shape now how can we link that back to our other definition of surface tension as the energy cost per unit area of surface well the sphere has a very interesting property among 3d shapes which is that for a given amount of volume the sphere always has the minimum amount of surface area and we know in physics that systems like to minimize their energy and so we would predict purely on the basis of uh, the fact that there's an energy cost associated with creating new surface area that a given drop of liquid wants to minimize its surface area and therefore settle into a sphere. So I hope this has given you a little bit more intuition as to how surface tension works. Thanks for watching and see you again soon.